That's spicy. Yeah. I don't think I can handle it anymore. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Live Your Mission Show, brought to you by Mission Meets, where our guests share their most actionable advice so that you can live a more mission-centered life. I am your host, Peter Awid, and today we are um, having Craig Emmerich on the show. Um, him and his wife, Maria, are icons in the keto lifestyle, um, as he calls it. And these guys have literally written the book on it. And so I wanted to have them on because I think it's important for uh, us as individuals to figure out what it is that we need to eat, what we need to consume, what we need to put in our mouths, as he says on the show, um, and what we shouldn't, that will um, give us the, you know, the best ability to be the best versions of ourselves. And so um, on this show, we talk about all kinds of things. Um, he gets into the science of um, keto and then specifically the carnivore diet that he is exploring as well. And there's just lots of really good information on here, um, how he uh, has worked through uh, essentially not curing his limes, but keeping his symptoms at bay because um, limes is a lifetime thing as we, as we, some of us know. And, and so he just, he talks through all of that stuff and the, their journey and background, um, different uh, recipes that they've used, how they um, have their, both their sons follow the keto diet as well and how they've made that a success. And, um, how they have physically actually grown from it, from being 2% on the, you know, the, um, the range for their age um, and getting all the way up to the 75% range and staying there. So um, very, very good episode. Um, I, I talked to him through and asked him some questions that I always think about, which is how can you be such a proponent of keto? And then the next person I talk to is a raw vegan and thinks that's the best thing. Like what is, you know, how, how do you, um, reconcile those two things. And so he, he addresses that very well. And so um, I think you guys are really going to love this episode from Craig and uh, be exposed to some of their content. If you go and, and check out what they're doing, which you should, um, these guys are just really both amazing individuals that, um, that have the knowledge and the background to share and to help you live this lifestyle or at least try it um, and be most likely to su succeed with it. So Check that out. Um, we'll have plenty of other um, folks like them on the show that are sharing other diets as well. And so um, we'll be able to see these from all different angles. And so um, I'm, re I'm really excited about that as well. You'll also get to see him try to eat some Carolina Reaper um, as a self-professed person who doesn't like spicy food. And so that is uh, that was kind of not fun to watch him cough on it and stuff like that, but you know, it is, there's a little bit of humor there. Right. Um, and so, um, he did, he did, did that. So anyways, I won't spoil it anymore. Now let's get on with this episode with, uh, Craig Emmerich. Thank you. Craig, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Hey man, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. We're going to jump right in. So when someone asks you what you do, what do you say? What's your current mission? Uh, you know, uh, we have dedicated so much of our time over the past 15, 20 years to helping people. Uh, and it's all about health. You know, a lot of people think about keto or carnivore as, you know, a weight loss thing or, you know, quick fix to lose some weight. Uh, what we found over the last 15 plus years of helping people with this lifestyle and in our own lives is that it's more about health than it is about weight loss. And weight loss is just kind of a side bonus to how good they feel. And so, you know, we've kind of dedicated our mission as spreading this is it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle that can not only help you lose weight, but make you feel better, get off your medications, you know, reverse symptoms from all kinds of autoimmune disorders and other issues. And we're just all about spreading the word of that health message. And why is it uh, important to make the distinction of lifestyle versus diet? Um, because if you think of a diet, diet is something you do for a short period of time to lose some weight, and then you go back to the way you were. Um, and for us, it's, it's as much about healing as anything. And if somebody has terrible autoimmune condition, 
where whether it's digestive issues, Crohn's, colitis, you know, or skin issues, eczema, these type of issues that can really be, I mean, it's really rough when you're dealing with those chronic kind of conditions, uh, especially like pain, like fibromyalgia or Lyme disease, which I have. And you, when you do this and you see how much better you feel, it, you don't want to go back. <laughs> you know, you don't want to go back to the way you used to feel with the pain, with the inflammation, with the skin issues. And so to look at it as a lifestyle is much better to set your mindset that I'm not just going to do this for a while and I can go back to eating donuts. I'm going to do this as it's a, uh, something that's going to be better for my health in the short term and for the long term. And so looking at it as a lifestyle, I think makes, makes it easier to, to have that vision. Yeah, I agree, man. And it's interesting because diet has become this short-term thing. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's, an, it's a term that somebody associates with this is something I'm going to do for a period of time. But really diet is what you eat, right? It doesn't have to be exactly. a short-term thing, right? Um, so I see why you're using that now because it's like you can't even like try to retrain people to think diet is what you eat, not this yeah. short period of time, this 30-day challenge or whatever. Um, well, yeah, it, it, like, something I like to spin with people on that is – They'll tell me, so you eliminate all fruit? How can you eliminate a whole food group? And I say, you know, diet is anything you choose to put in your mouth. And you choose to put some things in your mouth, other things you choose not to. And number one, we eat lots of fruit. We eat olives, avocados, cucumbers, right? Um, and then I ask them, so do you eat any organ meats? You know, liver, you know, uh, kidney. They'll say no, and I'll say, you, you're eliminating a whole food group from your diet, right? I mean, it sets the mindset of, oh, okay, everybody chooses to eat certain things and not to eat others. That's right. That's right. And so you, you have uh, alluded to this. So you, you, you have uh, limes. Tell me yeah. a little bit about that, what you were going through or what you were experiencing for someone who hasn't gone through limes. Like, what's that? I mean, is it joint pain? Is it other things? And then why keto? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, so uh, kind of my journey in general was, you know, I, I actually have an electrical engineering degree and I spent a lot of years working on Intel, you know, processors and those kind of uh, things. And my wife was finding her own journey to healing. And as she learned and wrote books about her, her uh, what she was learning, she was going on this path. And it took me a little longer because I brewed my own beer and, you know, I, I had the German background and uh, so it took me a few years after her to kind of come around. Um, but when I did, I, I just started, you know, I saw her as a, she led by example. She had endless energy. She never had any afternoon slump where you want to get tired and take a nap or, you know, that those cravings and hunger just kind of go away and you don't think about food all day. She was getting all these things. And I wanted that, especially when I was still working in a cubicle job and I was, you know, working long hours and, you get tired. Um, so I just started doing it more and more. And, you know, 10, probably 12 years ago, I went full keto and I've never looked back. And so what's interesting about my journey with Lyme is that I was always keto. I started getting symptoms about seven years ago. Um, it started in my lower back as just a pain and stiffness that I thought was related to a high school football injury that I damaged a disc in my low back and had issues on and off. So I didn't think anything of it. But over, the, over about five years, it just got worse and moved up my back more and more at my neck, face of the skull, just this stiff pain. And I finally realized when you know, my seven-year-old son could throw a football farther than I could because of all the pain I was experiencing, that something is just wrong. I'm too young to be like this. Mm -hmm. And so I went in and initially they, they give you a Western blot line test, which is a standard line test. They came back negative. Um, but I later found out those are up to 70% of the time they show false negative. So that's, you say negative, but you really have it because wow. they don't test all the bands and they don't test. So I got the proper test done and it came back positive. Um, it was an hygienic test. So at that point, I had already been carnivore, or sorry, keto for the whole five years I was experiencing this. 
Um, so I think it helped me to manage my pain because a lot of our clients will come from standard American diet with Lyme disease. And when they come to keto, they see a huge reduction in pain and, you know, issues. So I was keto the whole time. So I think it, it was a good, a blessing and a curse, right? Because it enabled me to manage the pain for so long and not address it. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens with Lyme is if you treat it right away, right? If you, you know, get the bullseye and within a first month or so you treat it, it's pretty easy to treat. But Lyme disease, uh, when it becomes chronic, the Lyme infection will depress, it, it, it causes inflammation, it depresses your immune system. And so when your immune system is so depressed because of the Lyme, all these other problems start creeping in. Heavy metals, mold toxicity, you know, all of these, uh, you know, cavitation, I had cavitation surgery, which is a awful thing where they go in and uh, my wisdom teeth that were pulled out years ago, that cavity left behind that you get an infection in there and the line can hide in that. So they open up the jaw and they scrape the infection away. And so all this stuff can happen. And it's, and anybody who's been through chronic Lyme understands that it's a multi-year journey to try to get claw back your health. Um, and one of the, one of the tools that I found and through some research that can be even more effective with Lyme and the pain is carnivore. And that's about a year and a half ago after my diagnosis, I started to transition to more strict carnivore and it has helped my pain a lot. And even some of the uh, first people to do carnivore as a diet, like Charlene Anderson, she did it, she's been doing it for 20 years because of chronic Lyme disease. And this was the, her path to find that she could manage the pain. Tell us about carnivore. What's the difference between carnivore and the keto? Diet? Yeah, you know, it's just a subset of keto. You know, it's, it's, you're still ketogenic because you aren't eating any carbs. Um, and what you do is you uh, basically eliminate the plants. And the reason that, and I have a presentation in next week, uh, which will probably be in the past and when this goes live, but at uh, Low Carb Houston, okay. uh, really good event held by Dr. Nadir Ali. He's a cardiologist. Um, I'm going to do a presentation on a case for carnivore. And one of the cases I make is for chronic pain, autoimmune, Lyme disease. And the reason I think is when you have these conditions, your immune system is depressed. And plants all come with negatives. Nobody talks about this. Mm -hmm. Plants have anti-nutrients. Thousands of these compounds that our body doesn't need or want. Things like oxalates, phytates, glucosinolate. So these, these are compounds that are in the plants that are basically natural defense mechanisms to fight off bugs from eating them. You know, a plant is, you know, and you think of a deer, what's its defense against being eaten? It runs away. What's the plant's defense? It can't run away. It's got to develop these compounds and enzymes over millions of years to defend itself against bugs. And it doesn't want you to eat the leaves, doesn't want you to eat the stalk, doesn't want you to eat the roots because that kills the plant. Mm -hmm. So it's developed these compounds that protect itself. Hmm. Well, in a, somebody with a perfect metabolism and no issues, they, they have detoxification pathways where you detox out these anti-nutrients your body doesn't want. And so you can eat plants and, and not have any issues. Unless you eat a lot of oxalates, then you can still have issues. But um, somebody with a depressed immune system like me, I can't de deal with it. You know, the body's already fighting all these uh, Lyme and these other issues those oxalates, those phytates, those compounds get into the system and cause wreak havoc. And this can lead to the joint pain, to the other, a uh, lot of other issues. And so going carnivore, you eliminate that. You take out all the stuff that your body doesn't have to detox anymore. And, it, and you just focus on eating the most nutrient dense food, by the way. We have these charts in our book that's showing, you know, just beef versus kale or blueberries or an apple and it beef just blows them out of the water for vitamins and minerals. And so you're eating nutrient dense food, doesn't have any anti-nutrients and it just enables your body to deal with the Lyme and other issues going on. Got it. All right. So before we have a complete like backlash from vegetarians, right? For example, <laughs> you're not saying that it's bad to eat them per se, but if you have, if your, your system's not up to par, so to speak, then 
And if you want to be able to heal your body, then you need to eliminate those from your diet. Is that what you're saying? I think it can help you by eliminating them because your body doesn't have to deal with detoxifying those things. Sure. But I would say that, you know, like oxalates, for example, oxalates are these tiny crystals that are in a lot of different things like, you know, kiwi, all nuts and seeds, uh, kale and leafy greens. They all have these little tiny crystals that kind of look like little spears and they can cause irritation and they can build up in the body. And they actually, when you go carnivore, a lot of people will get, you know, a sty in their eye or suddenly a skin rash that breaks out. It's oxalate dumping. It's your body pushing these oxalates out that have accumulated. Oxalate toxicity ranges from like three to 30 grams. Why it's such a huge range? Because of your metabolic state. So, you know, if you're somebody damaged metabolism, you know, with metabolic syndrome or Lyme disease, you might be more like three grams and you could die. Hmm. Three grams of oxalates being consumed. Uh, there was actually a man in Europe that ate three big bowls of uh, uh, the soup that had, that was uh, made with uh, vegetable that's high in oxalates and he died. So, I mean, you can die from these things, right? If you eat too much. That's why things like green smoothies are, can be dangerous. You drink like three, three green smoothies in a day, that could be three grams of oxalates. Uh, you know, again, if you're metabolically healthy, you might be able to handle up to 30 grams before it kills you, but it can still kill you, right? I mean, this is something that your body doesn't want or need. Got it. Now, so this, this brings up a point that something I've wondered about for a long time, and I'm sure you've been asked about this, both you and Maria. Um, there's so much conflicting information, right? So like yeah. we'll talk about carnivore diet, right? Which is an extreme on one spectrum. And then my next conversation could be with a raw vegan. Yeah. How do you reconcile these? Is it specific to the person? Are there some universal truths? Like how do you address it? Yeah, it's, you know, I joke sometimes that, you know, back in the eighties, if we took all the advice we're given about health, and did the exact opposite, we'd probably be better off. Yep. You know, low fat diets, cholesterol is the, you know, di eating cholesterol will kill you. Uh, you know, uh, things like, you know, dumping on sunscreen the second you're in the sun, even though we need that vitamin D, we need, you know, common sense, you know, 20, 30 minutes of sun exposure to keep our D levels good. I mean, there's so many of these recommendations that, we're just flat out wrong. And it, the, the most recent science shows that. And so, in, in, and, it, and they're starting to come around very slowly. Like they're no lot, you know, the, the, the food pyramid or whatever you want to call it. They don't say don't eat cholesterol and cholesterol, dietary cholesterol isn't an issue. They've kind of taken that out finally. And they're starting to shift their views. But, um, you know, we take, we look at the science. What does the science say? What does, uh, our biology say, you know, how do our bodies work? And in, in a, my presentation about carnivore, I talk a lot about this, our, our evolutionary history, how they did isotopic analysis of the collagen in the fossils of our er, early human ancestors and Neanderthals. And there's this chart and the higher you are, the more apex predator you are, and the more to the right you are, the more carnivorous you, you were in that time period, those early human ancestors were more apex than, than lions, than hyenas, than wolves, and more carnivorous. Mm -hmm. So they basically ate nothing but animal proteins, big woolly mammoths, you know, reindeer, and these type of things. Mm -hmm. So, and then analysis shows that. And so we came from an evolution you know, 30 to 50,000 years ago to now where we primarily ate meat. Yes, we can digest some animal, uh, plant, plant matter. But if you look at that as well, we have twice as long of a small intestine as other primates, which small intestine is good for digesting meat. We have half, less than half the length of our large bowel, which is good for digest, digesting plants. So why was that big shift made? Because as we grew big brains, we had to swap a big gut for the big brain, which means you got to go to the more nutrient dense foods and that's animal proteins. Hmm. 
Okay. So are you saying that there's also a link to, I mean, mental capacity and stuff like that? Well, I'm saying that's how we evolve. You know, if you go back to the primates, mm -hmm. why did this one group suddenly get these big brains and their, their guts shrunk? Mm -hmm. I think it's because what enabled that uh, evolution to happen mm -hmm. was the animal proteins. Got it. Got it. So, um, someone who's out there who's looking to um, either try out keto or try out carnivore, mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your advice? And let's say they're on a completely different diet. They're vegetarian right now yeah. or whatever, but they're considering their options. Would you say that um, this is a kind of a uniquely individual circumstance and that you really need to be testing kind of how your body responds to these different you know, dietary restrictions, so to speak? Um, or lifestyles, as you say, and give them time in order to feel like you are kind of logging the data, right? So what you're eating, how your body's responding, how you're feeling. And if you're going carnivore, get past this sort of, you know, sty in your eye situation, yeah. you're past that in order for that not to deter you. Is it uniquely individual, would you say? And then if you're, you know, having specific s situations and circumstances like limes or mm. eczema or different things like that, What's, what's your advice to these people? I think, uh, you know, anybody can transition to keto. And I think in general, I mean, you got to give it at least four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's one of the issues is people will, they'll go keto and suddenly their energy tanks, you know, they, they get the keto flu as it's called. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, this doesn't work for me. And after a week they quit. Well, there's certain things going on in the body. When you, uh, carbohydrates retain water. So uh, when you get rid of the carbohydrates, your body releases this water it's been retaining. That's a good thing. But with the water goes electrolytes. So things like salt, magnesium, potassium, they're gonna leach out when the water is dumped. Well, that can cause dehydration. That is typically what keto flu is, is dehydration. So you got to make sure to keep your electrolytes up when you start, especially when you start out, but also the body, you know, within two to three days of restricting carbohydrates, you'll start showing elevated blood ketones. So you start get transitioning to this sort of state, but you don't really become efficient at burning fat as your primary fuel until about four to six weeks. So what actually happens in the body and they've shown this is your body makes more mitochondria so that it can burn fat efficiently and so when this mitochondria is being developed and new new ones being made after about four to six weeks that's when you start seeing that energy spike you see the cravings plummet and you just mental clarity goes up and all these things that the brain loves to run on ketones um so you really got to give it at least four to six weeks to you know give it a fair shot and keep the electrolytes up in that time to keep the like keto flu away Knowing what you know now, I mean, and you, you know, you've been doing this for a long time, so it might be hard to think back. When you first started experimenting, what would you have done differently now, now knowing and having all the knowledge that you've got? Um, I'd probably just dive straight in. You know, I, when I started out, I would uh, eat whatever my wife made me during the week and then on the weekends kind of do my own thing and have my beer and all that. And then, you know, over... Uh, after the more and more I ate during the week, the way you know, keto, um, the more and more the weekends made me feel terrible. Mm. And I finally made the connection after some time that, you know what, it's because of what I'm eating and what I'm putting in my mouth on the weekends that makes me feel like crap on Sunday and Monday, right? So it's not worth it. So I would, if I did it over, I would dive straight in and just not even do any cheats or, you know, weekend kind of thing and go straight to keto. Yeah. I do think, though, just to maybe contradict your point, uh, I feel like you need to feel the difference um, yeah. because you're talking about cutting out beer, right? And so I can already like envision person watching this right now that's like, beer, dude, no way. I'm not giving that up. Or, you know, donuts every once in a while or whatever, right? Uh, bread, right? Like I was about to eat some bread right before we started recording. I thought, no, nope, I'm talking to Craig. I probably should eat this bread. I'll eat it after I talk, right? So, but I feel like, and I know a friend of mine that's, that dove into keto pretty heavy, it, it required him to like fall off the wagon a few times for him to be like, oh my gosh, 
Yeah. This is what I used to feel like all the time. Um, yeah. Because I think that if your baseline is that funk, you don't yeah. know you're in a funk, right? Exactly. For, for you on the weekend, you drank your beer and you're like, oh, dude, this is what I used to feel like. And my yeah. current example is I was talking to another um, guest in the show. I did a three day water fast for a number of different reasons. And when I got off of it, like it was like three days later, I had a coffee at a local coffee shop here and I felt mm. my, my digestive like pain kick in right away. And I was like, oh, this is one of the things that's triggering this pain that I'm having and these issues that I'm having. Yeah. I'm not going to have that anymore. So I almost needed it, right? I needed the sharp contrast to know. Yep. And because the other thing is too, is it's, it's a motivator. You're like, okay, I really like beer, dude. I really like beer, right? For this, whoever this person is that I'm talking to. But it's not worth this discomfort that I'm having or this lethar- lethargy or whatever you want the words to call them. This, yeah. this like, you know, loss of energy. It's not worth it. Yep. And, uh, you know, what we actually tell our clients is that journal, write down how you feel afterwards, because time is the great, you know, makes everything in the past a little more fuzzy and, you know, you forget about the bad parts. And, uh, you know, if you write it down and you come to a weekend and you're considering doing it and you go back and look at those notes and how terrible you felt the next day, mm-hmm it's going to maybe motivate you not to do that again. You know, don't beat yourself up if it happens, but you know, make a journal or do something so that next time you can make an informed decision. I don't need that. And what, what's, and what's important too, though, is give it some time to, to, you know, that four to six weeks to start feeling how good you can feel. And if it does happen again, note how you feel. Um, a lot of what happens is the body, if it's getting something like uh, gluten that, it doesn't really like that much. It's going to have antibodies ready for that to deal with that thing that's coming in that you're sensitive to, or you don't, your body doesn't really like. And so when you eat it, you don't get a big reaction because it's your baseline's kind of up here. Right. And so you, you don't really notice a big change when your body finally gets a chance to deal, not have to deal with that anymore. And now your baseline's down here and you see the reaction when you eat it and how your body really reacts to that food it can be striking. Like people, like you said, they'll eat one piece of bread or one donut and it's like they're it, completely ill the next day. Mm-hmm. That's your body's normal reaction. And, that, and you're right. It's, it's good feedback to say, I don't need that. Yeah. It's just like if I have fried food or something when I haven't had it in a very long time, the next morning I wake up, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can barely open my eyes. I just feel super yeah. puffy. I feel bad. Yeah. Um, and I need, for me, I, I'm stubborn. So I need that to say, dude, that was good, but it wasn't that good. You know, yeah, this, not is not, this is not worth it. And so um, a couple of practical tips, and I've got two angles for you to answer, Craig. Um, one is on the, on the, the you know, the, the lifestyle side, I almost said diet, the lifestyle side of things, a couple of practical tips. You've mentioned journaling. Um, mm-hmm. I've mentioned kind of sharp contrast between, you know, this lifestyle versus the other. Are there a couple of other tips as it pertains to the keto journey or the, you know, the, the uh, change in diet journey um, that you could give the audience that's like, hey, if you're going to start somewhere, just start here in order to yeah. at least feel some change and kind of kickstart it so then you can be motivated to continue down the path. Do you have a couple? Yeah, you know, um, if, if you're not ready to dive all the way in, just start with changing breakfast. You know, instead of toast and cereal and these things that, you know, an hour later you're starving because your blood sugar is plummeting, um, try some eggs and bacon, you know, just switch over your breakfast, uh, see how much better you feel in the morning and thereafter. Uh, and then maybe you can, you know, transition some of your lunches and and those kind of things. Um, another really, uh, important thing that can really help people in the beginning, if they're coming from, you know, a standard American diet, we've kind of lost track of cooking in in this country and home cooked meals in a lot of cases. And so it's going to take you more time to make whole foods, right? It just, you know, we, we make some arguments that it technically isn't like we, Marie and I, uh, we, we get a lot of things delivered, which is another great tip is, you know, getting meat and products delivered to your home. So you don't have to go to the store, but she made, uh, her Chipotle at home with hamburger and my son helped her and, I got in the car with my other, our other son, and I drove to the Chipotle that was pretty close, mm-hmm. waited in line, got the order for a Chipotle bowl, brought it home, and by the time I got home, 
this, my other son was, they cooked it, he ate, they cleaned up, had leftovers by the time I got home. So <laughs> is it really longer? No. But, you know, you got to be mindful about it and uh, allocate the time. And we tell people, you know, take Sunday, allocate a couple hours to prep for the week. You can make a big batch of like our, we have this uh, chili that people love or our, one that people really love is our protein noodle lasagna, which is basically lasagna and you replace the noodles with uh, shaved, you know, chicken breast or, you know, meat. It, mo a lot of people say it's better than the original. Make a huge batch, put it in single serving sizes, throw it in the freezer or fridge, and you got easy meals for the week. You know, planning ahead can really help keep you on track. Yeah. And don't you, there's some side benefits too. I mean, you guys are working together in the kitchen, laughing and talking and yeah. maybe spending some time you normally wouldn't have spent. Exactly. Um, you know, like I would venture to guess that the conversation that day in the kitchen was maybe a little bit better. Um, and, and more memorable than the drive to Chipotle and back it's possible, you know? Yep. Um, and so there's all these ancillary benefits that will help us maybe be more grounded and, as a and movement and movement, like just walking around the kitchen, chopping, moving versus sitting in the car right? Like it's that movement too, that those unconscious movements can really help you in the long term. you know, parking on the uh, farthest spot on the parking lot at the grocery store and walking through the grocery store to pick up your food. And, you know, all these things add, add up and that, that can be a big health benefit too. Yeah. Awesome, man. All right. And then on the, on the other side of things, as far as your mission to be the uh, resource, right? Like the top resource for keto, you and your wife, um, mm -hmm. what has been what are a couple of practical tips for someone out there that's got some information, right? Some knowledge that they haven't been sharing with the world. Um, maybe they're working a job that they're good at, but it's not part of their passion or their purpose, right? Um, yeah. How did you make that switch? I mean, dude, you're an electrical engineer, right? I, was, I have a mechanical engineering degree. I know what engineers do. They don't talk yeah. to people. They sit in a cubicle and they crunch numbers really, really well. Um, but they don't necessarily like get out behind the you know, camera as you're doing now or on stage talking to people. I'm going to make a guess and say that's probably not your natural instinct is like start talking to a big audience, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. How did you make the leap and what's, what are a couple tips for someone out there that's like, dude, I'm, I, I know I've got some knowledge on this and I'm, I could be an expert, but I'm having a hard time making that leap. What do you have? Actually, I am a little bit different in that perspective because uh, I was, I, I was an electrical engineer for, I don't know, 10 years and I moved into product management. Okay. So I, I, as a product manager, one of the things you got to learn is how to communicate with people, uh, you know, very technical things. You have to really understand the technical things, but then you got to disseminate that to salespeople, to customers, to, you know, mm -hmm. PhD electrical engineers that are working in a lab. You got to be able to communicate those things. So I, I learned that skill over a number of years and I kind of transitioned it to this space. Okay. Uh, but I think in general, what people can do is just start disseminating the information, whether that's, you know, making a blog, it's really simple to put a blog up and just start putting your thoughts and your, in, your information out there and sharing it. Uh, you know, a podcast, you know, there's a lot of little things that you can do to start sending your message out. And from that, you know, engaging with people is how you start growing. And uh, I think that's the best step that you can do on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Just start. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, I think it could be just to add to that, Craig, I think that it could be just as simple as have starting like a little local group where yeah. you are sharing this information with people that are actually interested in it. Um, yeah. And I saw like a sampling of this last night. My wife's really into Eastern medicine and she's really into um, just, just, you know, eating well and taking care of yourself and all this stuff. And so um, she's taking a class on it and then someone else had asked her like, Oh, what have you been doing? She, she brought it up and they were interested. And so they started talking about it and, and the, the friend of ours was like, Oh, can we meet up and talk more about it? And to me it's like, there's a little glimpse, right? Like you've got yeah. some information, you're really passionate about it. You're knowledgeable about it, becoming knowledgeable about it. There's one person, right? Yeah. <laughs> Add another. Exactly. And we, we actually have uh, in the past year started doing a keto coach training program. Mm -hmm. And so we train coaches to be keto coaches, you know, and spread the message more. And that's one of the big things we hit on is, in, and that's what we did is, focus on local first you know you get out there on the web and it's just it's so hard to get a, a, a message that you know starts to resonate with people and people get eyeballs on it um, but if you start out local that's what we did you know Maria would go and she set up time at the local library where they give you a conference room for free mm -hmm. where you could 
do a presentation and we'd invite people to come for free to hear this message. And, you know, my, at first it was five people or, you know, three people, but from that grew the message, you know, they took it home, they tried it, they saw how good they felt. Everybody's asking them, what are you doing? You look amazing. So they, they say, you know, that's how you spread locally. And from locally, you can spread further. But I, I think that is a big key to building is the local part of it, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. This is, it, you're talking and remind me of uh, an old article by uh, a guy named Kevin Kelly, uh, founder of, uh, of Wired Magazine. And he wrote an article back in 2008 called 1000 True Fans. And so you just Google that mm. and you find it. Um, yeah. And it's just essentially this, right? Like you yeah. don't need a critical mass, like this mass, this huge mass of, of followers. You just need some, a, a small group of passionate followers, whether it's a thousand, hundred, ten, doesn't matter. But you know, just this group that's like truly invested in what you're doing and following what you're doing. And then it'll grow from there. Right. Exactly. You know, we've been blessed to have such a strong following with our, throughout our journey. I think it's because we're, we're real and we're honest and we share, they trust us because we always base everything we do on the science and we're not afraid to change our opinion. Mm -hmm. I think true confidence is you're not afraid to change your opinion, right? Because you're learning and we're all in a learning. If I stop learning, you know, I'm done, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all going to continue to learn and we will implement what we learn with our clients, with our followers. And they, so they trust us and we have such an engaged following. It's, it's just crazy. I mean, uh, you know, we don't have the biggest number on Facebook for keto people or on Instagram, but I, I'd be willing to bet we have the highest engagement of anyone. Mm -hmm. We have a very engaged following and that's what's important. Yeah. Yeah. I can vouch for that too, man. You guys, your, your followers are very passionate. Um, and Great, for, for, for good reason, man. All right. Now we're going to switch gears to the fire round. Um, this is where our <laughs> guests answer some rapid fire questions while they attempt to eat some of our Carolina Reaper beef jerky. Are you ready? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not a big, uh, hot fan. So I will definitely try some. <laughs> I'm not going to guarantee how much. I will try no, worries. no worries. This is not right. legally binding, man. So get your bag ready. Um, okay. I'm going to ask you these questions. They're going to be rapid fire on my end, but feel free to have as um, long or as short an answer as, as you like, ma'am. So um, first question is, and I'll, I'll let you eat a piece first. You sure? <laughs> I'm, I'm positive. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> All right. So favorite book could be in the last year. could be a classic for you. It doesn't have to be business related or keto related. Um, just something that comes to mind when somebody asks you what your favorite book is. Um, actually, there's a book on Lyme disease called Toxic okay. that anybody who has Lyme or thinks they may have Lyme, <clears throat> uh, Toxic is like awesome. That's a great place to start. Okay. Okay, toxic. By Neil Nathan. <clears throat> Neil Nathan. Okay. Ah. It's hot. <laughs> Early or late riser. And what does that look like? Um, kind of in the middle. You okay. know, I I'm not my wife's a huge morning person. <clears throat> and so she's up at like five thirty and she's you know, we kinda have a sh different schedule. She gets a bunch of stuff done before the kids get up and I a lot of times will do work after they go to bed, so Okay. Uh, it works out well for us. Okay. Have you always been on that kind of routine? Has anything changed as you changed your diet? I pretty much always been that way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, any quotes you live your life? <clears throat> uh, uh, probably the education piece. Okay. Always keep learning. Always keep educating yourself. There's, if you ever think you know everything about a topic, you don't. There's always somebody who knows more or can, can share a piece of <clears throat> information that helps you okay okay that's spicy yeah i don't think i can handle it anymore. <laughs> so if you if you want to see someone like i i ate a whole bag on instagram oh. and and uh it didn't hit me till actually after i was done eating the whole <clears> bag <throat> um and it was hot that was a hot bag. oh i can't um, do it <laughs> <laughs> okay um so that real quick on the education piece um do you think that's what's fueled your um passion not fueled your passion but has fueled your growth in the keto <clears throat> space because I, I feel like you have to have some sort of innate um 
desire to continue to improve and to discover and to learn things on your own versus have this prescriptive information like this is the diet that you need, Craig, and this is what you're going to follow. Um, do you think that's what fueled kind of like your discovery, especially with, with the carnivore stuff, which is even to me even farther extreme? I, I do. I think it, and I think a lot of it stems back to that engineering background. You know, there's a lot of engineers in this space now. There's, you know, people like Ivor Cummins, who's done, got great information on cholesterol and, and this lifestyle. He's an engineer. Uh, Tyler Cartwright, uh, Marty Kendall. There's, there's all of these. Dave Feldman who's doing great stuff on cholesterol. These are all engineers. Mm -hmm. I think that <clears throat> the reason that they're coming into this space and having success is because they look at things differently and they're open to change. You know, as an electrical engineer, if I didn't educate myself on the new technologies coming down the pipe, I'd be obsolete in six months. Yeah. So you constantly had to learn and adapt and change and change based on the new things and that, that were happening and the new discoveries. So I think bringing that into this space, you bring that same mindset and you look at things more as a system and say, okay, if my outputs are wrong, what, what's, what did I mess up on my inputs? And that's why I looked at things as an electrical engineer. If I got a part and my outputs aren't right, were, were my inputs right? And yet in, in healthcare, so much today is your outputs are wrong. Okay, let's add this prescription to mask these outputs and kind of cover up some of these symptoms. Why don't we go back and look at those inputs? Let's look at diet. Let's look at how much exercise you're getting, how much sleep you're getting, how much sun exposure you're getting. All, you know, are you smoking? And all the, these are all inputs to the body. And when they, those inputs get messed up, the outputs get messed up. And if you go back and fix the inputs, the, output, the outputs take care of themselves. And I think that's kind of that systems or engineering approach that can be so helpful in this space. That is such good advice, man. Because right, that's, that's distilling it all down, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if you're this engineering phrase, which you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, exactly. And that's, I mean, that's, that's part of it, right? Um, and Fire it's right. interesting you say the engineering piece because David Hauser, who we had on the show, also a programmer who then said, dude, we had all success applying this methodology to business. Why am I not doing it to my health? And so exactly, he exactly what he, he didn't invent a new system. He said, I'm going to take this process of tinkering and I'm going to apply it to my health. Yeah. And so exactly. that's fascinating, man. Um, in the last five years, what new belief or behavior has most impacted your life? Or I'll say it another way. What have you changed your mind about? What did you believe to be false before and now you believe to be true? Um, just about animal protein in general. Okay. You know, I looked at it as you know, literally when I started writing our book, Keto, I wrote half of it with my wife uh, and I wrote a whole chapter on the nutrients in beef because, you know, we were... I was probably started writing that book, I don't know, five, six years ago. And I'd been in this space for a while, thought I knew something about nutrition and, and what's in our food. And yet nobody talks about, yeah, that steak is loaded with nutrients. You don't see the message on TV. You don't see that anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I started researching it and running the numbers. And I'm like, what the heck? Why did I not know this? Mm -hmm. Like it, just the nutrient dense, the most nutrient dense food on the planet pretty much is beef liver. Like you can't put something in your mouth that has more uh, vitamins and minerals than beef liver and uh, beef by itself beats almost anything. So, you know, that knowledge of looking at animal proteins as your source of nutrients was a huge change for me. Uh, and I, I think in general, people just don't see that. But I think, you know, and there's many other aspects of animal proteins that we could go into, like the environment and some of these things that are commonly thought today as problems, mm -hmm. which really aren't. And, you know, I, one of the things I've really been on a, a agenda to promote is the fact that properly raised animals and then specifically ruminants can actually help reverse climate change, not be of negative impact on it. And I've been trying to message that a lot because that is a, it's such a crazy thing to think about that something like uh, fossil fuels that are like 28% of our problem of emissions isn't being talked about more aggressively when we're talking so aggressively about cattle, which are like 2%. Mm -hmm. And even then you got to think of what is the cattle? Cattle is a cycle, right? So think about the atmosphere. You, you have the methane emissions, but those cows are not alchemists, right? 
They didn't make carbon out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Where did they get the carbon? They got it from the grass they ate. Mm -hmm. Where did the grass get it? From the air. So you're getting carbon out of the air and it goes through the cow. Some of it comes back out, but then it goes back to the grass and you got to cycle. Mm -hmm. Fossil fuels uh, like, uh, that are pulled out of the ground, that's carbon coming out of the ground that wasn't in the atmosphere. And it's going to go in and have a thousand year life of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that is adding and adding. And actually a lot, there's been an increase in methane over the past several years. There was a study that was just done that linked it to fracking, not cows. The type of methane that has increased is the type of methane that comes from fracking. So again, that's, a, that's new methane coming in. That's not coming from carbon dioxide through grass, through a cow and out, through a, a natural cycle. So I, I think we gotta focus on what the science is telling us and what is the real problem and not these false problems. Yeah, like something that's such a minuscule percentage of the overall problem, right? Yeah, even um, and, and then on top of it, it's a cycle versus, you know, new coming out of the ground and pumped up. You know, that's yeah. a huge difference. Yeah, the difference between something that was like previously trapped, not going to be released potentially. I'm no scientist. Exactly. Though, you know, exactly. versus something that was just part of that cycle and the animal yep. would be part of it. Yeah, I totally get that, man. All right, a um, couple last questions here. Um, what should I have asked you, but I didn't? <laughs> um. Boy, maybe about my kids, how they're keto. <laughs> you know, we uh, yeah. got our, our, we adopted our sons from Ethiopia when they were one and two years old and it immediately just started feeding them food, the food we ate. And, you know, that could be beef pureed up so our youngest could eat it, you know, avocados, egg yolks, salmon, they loved salmon, just real food. You know, when I look at these, jars of baby food it's just like you know we didn't have baby food <laughs> when we you know our paleo ancestors didn't they they ate food right and the food primarily you know just fuel growth is animal protein and they actually came to us at uh like two percent on the growth mm. charts height and weight because they nutritionally were not getting you know the, what they needed in, in the orphanage um within one year feeding them this way, basically keto, because it's all animal proteins and you know, avocados and these type of things. Uh, they were at 50% on the growth charts. And then year, by year two, they're at 75% on the growth charts and they've stayed there. So, you know, there's a, this other myth of, you know, keto can stunt your growth for kids or something based on these flawed studies. Well, it's not true. Not if they're getting enough protein. What's your, I love that story, man. Thank you. Um, what's your advice to someone who's kids have been eating a conventional western diet um how do you how do you, how do you take kids from cereal yeah. and put them on eggs or how do you take kids from cereal and put them on avocado it's uh so number one it's it's depends a lot on the age right i mean if you're talking about a toddler i tell parents does the, does the toddler go to the store and buy things you know, if it's not in the house, they can't eat it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a pull the Band-Aid off and get it out of the house. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. There may be some, you know, tantrums and things, but he's going to get hungry. Or they're going to get hungry and they're going to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a lot of transition kind of things that uh, one of the things is we really wanted our youngest to eat eggs, but he wouldn't eat eggs. And so my wife is like this alchemist of her, of her own uh, with recipes. She's, she can just it's amazing some of the things she comes up with she started she started thinking well what if i took hard boiled eggs and put a little natural sweetener in there and maybe some uh cocoa and made pureed it and sure enough it's pudding i mean literally it's chocolate pudding but it's just hard, based on hard boiled eggs that's crazy and you wouldn't believe it it's in, she put she put that recipe recently in her a uh, couple of her books and people cannot believe that recipe. I mean, you leave it sit in the fridge overnight and the next day it's chocolate pudding. It's just crazy. But That's... you can do those kind of things with your kids. You know, if they're not willing to eat eggs, but they'll eat chocolate pudding, there you go. You, you're, they're eating hard boiled eggs. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, she even did, did a hard boiled egg based waffle. So, you know, they can have waffles or, you know, these type of things that can help transition. Mm -hmm. If they're older kids, you know, that obviously is going to be tougher because you can't, you know, they, they're out of the house and different things. Uh, you know, for us, we talk a lot about education mm -hmm. and, you know, 
feeding them at home what you what you think is healthy and then be having them be mindful about how they feel again back to that feeling you know if they go and have some pizza and soda and they feel terrible help them connect that and help them ed- educate on how their body feels when they have certain things yeah yeah and and empower edu- them to make the better choice the education piece is huge and that's that's all yeah. of life right it's like you can tell a yeah. kid what to do but if you can at least teach them why things are important and help them understand it for themselves it's going to be different yeah totally. um, and i like what you said you said about getting it out of the house for the kids <clears throat> that's for the adults too Exactly. Like, I have no self-control when it comes to like eating certain things like sweets for me, forget it. And yeah. so if they're not in the house, I don't eat it. It's like magic, exactly. right? It's not there to eat. I don't eat it. Right. Go figure. But if yeah. it's there, I'll kill it. I'll eat a whole dozen cookies, you know, game over. Nobody knows where they went, including myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you got to just get the stuff out of the house and then it's just yeah, not an the option. best thing you can do. Yeah. 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 All right, man. Last question. What's your favorite mission meets flavor? I like the, the, the uh, protein bars. Okay. My kind of go to, I, I mean, literally, that is the, the protein. You, know, you, think, you think people talk about protein bars? Yeah. This is a protein bar. Those yes, aren't sir. protein bars. Those are processed junk. This is a protein bar. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we made those, man. Because those, those exactly. are, like you said, that is a literal protein bar. It is yeah. beef <laughs> in a bar shape, right? Yep. And, and yeah. back to the thing about nutrients, it's got all the nutrients in the beef, right? Mm-hmm. Where you get some processed you know, plant protein, you know, isolate protein bar. It's, if it might have a multivitamin dumped in, but you know, mm-hmm. getting it from whole foods is always better. Yeah. Totally agree, man. Well, dude, uh, Craig, thanks for the time. Thanks for trying the Reaper jerky. I can tell it was <laughs> hot for you. So thanks for doing uh, that, man. <laughs> if, a, if the audience members want to get a hold of you, follow what you're doing, what's the best way? Uh, we have a lot of free information and recipes on our blog. It's mariamindbodyhealth.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we have a bunch of support uh, and packages and ebooks and things on our keto-adapted.com website. And then on social media, just look for Maria Emmerich or Craig Emmerich. And uh, Keto Adapted on Facebook is our group. And that you'll find us there. Very good. And your last name ends with a CH. I was calling you Emmerich yeah. forever. So if you're listening to this, it's CH at the end, not a K or CK. Um, and then you have, and we didn't mention it, but you've got, you guys have a new book coming out. Yeah. Um, actually we got two. Uh, we're busy. Okay. Um, we have, my wife has a keto air fryer book okay. coming out next month, in a couple nice. weeks. Uh, it's awesome. Loaded with air fryer recipes, which really are great. Cause you can do so many things in the air fryer when you like, even like she made an omelet that was just amazing. Hmm. Uh, some of the best recipes I've had from her that I, I get the benefit of testing, you know, when she's taking photos. Uh, but we also have the carnivore cookbook coming up in January. Okay. And that is going to be loaded with a lot of this information we've been talking about, about our evolutionary history, our human design, uh, all these things, and then a bunch of recipes that are carnivore. So those two books are coming. Okay. Very good, man. Well, Craig, thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Thanks so much for tuning in. It means so much to me and the entire Mission Meets team. Um, Now, what I'd like to do, um, aside from requests that you share and review the show, as we all do, as all the shows do, um, I want to remind you that we would like to feature people that are living their mission on this show. And so um, if you know somebody, tag them on social with the hashtag live your mission um, or email us and uh, we'll mention them on the show. We'll pick someone, some of our favorites and we'll mention them in the, either the intro or the outro. So if you know somebody that you feel like is really living out their mission, their purpose in life, tag them. We'd love to give them a shout out. Okay. Um, also, if you want to be part of the Mission Reaper Challenge, you don't have to be, but um, grab a bag of uh, Mission Meets Carolina Reaper jerky, record yourself eating it post it on social, tag us and tag Mission Reaper, hashtag Mission Reaper for your chance to win $100 of free Mission Meets Delicious Snacks. All right. That's all for today. Thanks so much for watching, for listening. Now get out there and live your mission. Thank you.